so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. It's a Saturday morning in the visitors' area of the maximum security section of Grafton Correctional Centre. And Stevie Munro and her sisters are chattering away to their dad about school, friends, and what they've been watching on TV. It's loud and awkward, and there's absolutely no privacy. Multiple conversations are happening on the white plastic tables, cramped in close proximity all around them. A buzzer goes off every now and then, and radios buzz like a constant white noise. It smells stale, like there's not enough air for all the people in the room. Soon, they'll exit back through the metal detectors, pick up their belongings from the lockers, and go through the process all over again in the minimum security side of the prison where their mum is. It's much nicer over there. They have a snack machine and barbecues, and they're allowed to sit outside. There's nothing unusual about today's outing in Stevie and her sister's eyes. They make the nearly 10-hour round trip from Moree with their nan and pop at least every second weekend. They like seeing their parents, but it's pretty boring, really. There's not much to do for a 12, 7 and 5-year-old in prison. At first, Stevie was angry when her parents were arrested. They were caught selling drugs in the family home and sentenced to three years each with an 18-month non-parole period. Little did she know, however, all the time she was spending learning about strip searches, contraband, work opportunities behind bars, restrictions and officer duties would end up having an enormous impact. As an adult, Stevie still spends a lot of time in prison. But this time, she's the one in charge as a New South Wales corrections officer. Stationed in the very same town her parents were arrested, the 32-year-old has a secret weapon that makes her brilliant at her job. She knows what it's like to experience crime from the inside and the outside. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. After her parents' arrest, Stevie Munro's life became a muddle of child services, custody battles, prison visits and schoolyard bullying. Fast forward to 2024, and she's now a senior correctional officer with Moree Court Escort Services. She's in charge of things like processing offenders who've just been arrested and escorting them to and from court. She deals with prisoners from all over Australia and has seen it all. Kicking, screaming, lashing out, attempted suicide. She is dealing with people during their most emotional times in prison. But as she will explain, her toughest days have nothing to do with the criminals themselves. Stevie is a mother of three and a proud Indigenous woman. She's also been selected out of 10,700 staff as an ambassador for National Corrections Day this year for her outstanding achievements in the job. Here's her story in her own words. Stevie, can you tell me about where you grew up and what your childhood was like? Yeah, so I grew up in Moree, not much out here. You either love it or you don't. I love it personally. It's a very small community. It's a high Indigenous population community. And my childhood was a little bit all over the place, let's say. My parents were very young when they had me. Mum was only 15 when she had me. Wow. I went between houses. So I essentially lived with my mum and dad, but I also lived with my dad's parents, so my nan and pop, who I I held in high regard or still hold in high regard, I should say. And we never really missed out on anything. We just breezed through life in a little country town. (laughs) And did you have siblings? Yeah, I've got two younger sisters, one of which is three years younger than me and the other is seven years younger than me. So it sounds like you had quite an idyllic childhood to start with, but at around 11 years old, 
everything kind of changed for you. Both your parents were arrested. What do you remember about that time? Unfortunately, I actually remember it all. I was the eldest and become, let's say, very grown up very quickly to my younger sisters. What I remember is I'm at home, well, at Nan and Pop's, and just all of a sudden in the driveway is all these police officers and we're going, what's going on here? Yeah, it turns out they were arresting both my mum and my dad and they were taken into custody, which was a bit, you know, at 11 years old, that's mm. a bit daunting. However, you know, it, it was what it was. Nan and Pop got us through it. There was a long court process sort of after that happened and then eventually they got sentenced and they ended up into custody for 18 months. So we lived solely with Nan and Pop for 18 months in a little two-bedroom house. All the girls bunked into to one room, but we got by, so that was good. Do you feel comfortable going into what your parents were charged with? I can't actually remember the exact charges, but I can say that it was trafficking. So it was drug trafficking. At the time, I had no idea what was going on. I didn't really know what was right and wrong. It's just something that you were just sort of conditioned to. You just knew that it was happening. You didn't sort of know what was happening. So looking back now, I can say, yep, no, that happened in and outside the house. It wasn't a drug usage as such, but it was drug trafficking. So they were selling, say, marijuana to others. And there was times when we were present when those deals happened, which at the time, again, you don't really know at a young age that that was what was going on. So, I'm getting the feeling talking to you that you didn't feel unsafe during any of this. It wasn't done in a sinister kind of way. No, definitely not. Definitely didn't feel unsafe. Having said that, you know, if I was to look back now, I would say it's not the greatest idea and it probably <laughs> isn't safe. But, you know, at the time there was no way we felt unsafe by any means. There was nothing untoward or anything like that. It was actually just quite a normality, to be honest. Had the police ever visited before they came to arrest? Not the house as such, not that I remember anyway, but definitely had pulled over the car whilst I might have been in the car with mum or dad or whoever, and they will pull the car over and just do a random search of the car. And I found that a little bit odd, but again, I didn't understand. Back then, everything was so naive. <laughs> you never really knew what was going on. So it was just normal to me. Do you remember how you felt when you found out what was actually happening, that they would be going to prison? Definitely. So when we found out that that is what was happening, it was definitely upsetting and it was a very big shock to myself and my younger sisters especially Maybe not as much to me as the younger girls because my younger sister was only, you know, like I say, very young at the time. She was only around four years old. So for her to understand, you know, mum and dad's not going to be there for a little while, you're solely just going to be here, it was a bit to process, let's say. It was definitely out of the ordinary and it was very upsetting at the time, yeah. Was it your parents that helped explain to you or your nan and pop or...? We were sort of given a pre-conversation to the actual sentencing from my parents. So we sort of knew a little bit, you know, of what could happen or what the possibilities were as such. So, of course, everyone was very upset. and But I think that helped us come to terms with when the unforeseen actually did happen. When they called us and said, you know, your mum and dad's gone to jail, it wasn't like a big smack in the face where you just weren't expecting it. We'd already had those conversations, so at the time it was like, okay, yeah, well, this is what was explained to me. Having said that, you don't really prepare yourself for what that entails. Mm. So, yeah. Did you visit? Definitely. We went there, if not every weekend, it was every second weekend. Both Nan and Pop worked and my uncle, who also lives with my Nan and Pop, they all worked full-time positions, so what we would do is early of a Saturday morning, we'd jump in the car, head over to Grafton. We'd spend, you know, Saturday, Sunday in the visits area, just visiting mum and dad. And then we'd stay at a little caravan park there, which is actually really nice. It was very, very welcoming to families. And then we'd come home and we'd do that. Like I say, if it wasn't every weekend, it was every second weekend. So we're always in the car. So do you have good memories of that? Or was it strange being in a prison every weekend? 
Initially, it was very strange. When we first got there, it was very, you you don't know what to expect because you watch all these movies, right, and you Mm. see all this Wentworth stuff and you're like, (laughs) oh, my God, is that what I'm walking into? But, no, it was definitely not like that. It was still daunting for a young child. It was very boring, I would say, (laughs) at that age. You sort of sit there going, oh, my God, can I go home yet? But, you know, outside that, it was definitely a strange feeling. After a little while, it just become normal. So, you know, mum would call up. If we went over early on a Friday afternoon at some stage, you know, she'd call up and say, oh, what time are you guys leaving? And then we'd let her know. So she'd be outside of her unit and we'd drive past, beat the horn, you know, you got to see her, you got to wave, say hello on your way past before you actually went in to visit. So it just become, you know, a normal thing that we sort of made light of at the time. And if you didn't do that, well, of course, you were just going to be down in the dumps. Were you ever angry at them? Definitely, definitely, yeah. I was probably more upset and frustrated than anything. You know, there was different times in being a young girl going into a teenage years, of course, those levels are going up and down. So, you know, there was times where I was angry and frustrated, upset. There was a mix of emotions really. But at the end of the day, you've sort of got to accept what it is and take it for what it is rather than just holding on to that anger. What were the ramifications for you? Because as you've said, you were you know, 11, probably going on 12, 13 when they were finally sentenced, I'm guessing, because it does take a while in our systems. So you're a teenager, you're a preteen. What was school like for you? Did everyone know, being a small town, did everyone know that your parents were in prison? Definitely, they did know. It's funny you say because going into my first year of high school is when they went away to prison and eventually, you know, I, I was bullied there was a lot of people that would say a lot of different things and, you know, knowing the truth behind it all, you're like, hang on, no, that's not right. But the more you tried to defend it, the more stories that would come about. So you just sort of give up in the end and go, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore. And that was part of why I was angry because I did inherit the role virtually of being a mum to my younger sisters, which I took on happily, don't get me wrong, but that formed part of my anger, being at school, you know, dealing with all the motions. But in saying that, I, I also had a really good group of friends and that helped me. So that was good. I want to talk about one of those friends because they did have quite a lasting impact on you. Can you tell me about them? One of their dads was an assistant superintendent with Corrective Services. Yeah. So I had a best friend going through school. Her name is Demi. And we were very, very close. We were always at each other's houses. You you know what young girls are like. Can I stay here? You know, social lives are better than anybody's. So (laughs) we grew very, very close. And her mum and dad were very close with myself and my family as well. Her dad was the assistant superintendent here at Maury at the time. And then when everything unfolded, it became a bit, it wasn't bad as such. However, there was just a lot of questions around what communication and visits and and that sort of stuff could happen between the families just due to your association. So I suppose getting to the bottom of that initially was difficult. It didn't hinder our friendship. You know, we're still very good friends for the most part of it. Still to this day, I'm, I'm actually good friends with her. So, you know, it didn't hinder a friendship as such, but it did put a stop on, you know, your general sleepovers, which obviously at the time a young girl, yeah, you know what, I'm angry at you for this. Mm. (laughs) So, But he was actually very good. Like her dad was very good for me because I got to see both sides to the system. Was that confusing for you? I can't imagine being a young girl and one weekend you go and visit your parents in prison outfits and the next you're having a sleepover with a friend whose dad is the one in charge of the actual facilities. That must have been so jarring. No, actually it was completely opposite. It actually helped me understand more of what was going on or why it was going on the way that it was. So, you know, in Grafton, in the old Grafton jail, I should say, when it was open and they had a side which was like a low-risk classification. So you'd go in to visit and there'd be this big open barbecue area where, you know, you have your offices and stuff like that, but then you also have all these inmates that have families and whatever else come and visit and it's just like... It's basically like a day out at the park but within walls. <laughs> That's virtually how you need to look at it sometimes. So you've seen the officers in there and you go, oh, yeah, I know what they're doing. Like I understand that. So you've seen that side of it but then you also heard the other side of it as well. So it did help me understand and process a lot better at that age than what I would have if I didn't see that from him, yeah. 
Given that your parents were in the justice system, was there any risk of you going down that path? I mean, of course there was probably always going to be and I see a lot of it within my job now with with other people. However, I do think it comes down to the individual and what they're willing to do with their life. For me, I looked at what unfolded, how I felt at the time, how my sisters felt, how my family felt, and I went, you know what, that's definitely not something that I want to do again. I don't want any of that. And, and look, I, I say to the guys that come in here all the time, I hope that this is how someone else can look at it, you know, because a lot of people will say, my mum was this, my dad was that, you know, they did this, they did that. And I go, well, hang on, mine did too, but that's no excuse. You can't use it as an excuse. Yeah, that's what I find. I took in the opposite direction than other people do. Yeah. Did you know that early on, though, that you wanted to actually go into corrections? No, no, I didn't. I did like the idea of the job. But at the time, I wasn't even thinking of a career. There was nothing that even crossed my mind at the time. I had kids very young as well. So I was 19 when I had my first daughter. I was at home, you know, I just worked a job when I wasn't pregnant, let's say, and wasn't being a mum. So I just done, you know, office duties and tax consultant, that sort of line of work. And then once I'd finished having my children, I went, oh, you know what, this isn't for me anymore. I, I want a career. And I started researching, you know, what would I like to do as a career, which is when this popped up and I went, oh, that's something I'd be able to do. It's something I have a passion for. It's something I'd like to do. So that's where it led me. Were people surprised when you went into corrective services? I mean, I imagine in a small town where everyone knows everyone's business that people might have made a comment or two. I think people kind of expected it from me, from my personality, let's say. <laughs> if they've known me growing up, they go, oh, yeah, that's definitely suited. But you're right, on the other end of it, they're like, you know, how did she get in because her parents did this, that sort of stuff. So I think, you know, what they expect the process to be isn't exactly that. And once it's all explained, it actually sparks people's interest in the job, which is great. What about your parents? How did they react? Look, they were actually quite proud. They had a lot of respect for the officers that were there. They accepted what they did and they moved forward with it. So they had a lot of respect for, you know, correctional officers and to see their daughter go through and and be that person, they just, they were quite proud. What do you have to do to get in to the academy? It's actually quite a process, believe it or not. I waited months and months and months. I, I actually think it might have just been over 12 months from the time I actually applied for the position to then jumping through the hoops, you know, of your medical assessments, your psychometric assessments, your interview stage, your actual medical that has to take place all before you get the green light to actually get an academy date. (laughs) What I know of corrections services, and I'm going to sound probably a bit silly here, as someone that does know a lot about crime and court and police work, but I think of the ones that are actually in the prisons looking after the inmates. I guess I I also think of in the courtroom, they're the people kind of minding the inmates while they're going through those processes. But it is a lot more than that, isn't it? There's a lot of different roles that you can kind of take on. It is definitely a career that would send you in many directions if you wanted to. If you got bored in Corrective Service New South Wales, there is something seriously going wrong because there is so many avenues in this job, it's not funny. Can you list some of them? Give me some examples of something I could do once I'm in there. Once you're in, you could do like community corrections, which is also known as, you know, like a probation parole officer. So it's more office work. You can do the HR side of things. It's not all about just with offenders one-on-one doing the everyday, you know, prison officer duties as such. But then, you know, you have your specialised units where you could go into the IAT unit, so an immediate action team or you can go into a specialised group with a drug dog or a multi-purpose dog. The list just goes on, yeah. It has a lot of similarities really to the police force in terms of different squads and kind of roles. Definitely. You should never get bored, never. (laughs) (laughs) I want to talk about your work with the Moree Court Escort Security Unit. What a mouthful. The CESU. What does that mean? What are you in charge of? So what they do here is you might want to think of it like a mini prison. 
as such or what people would call a watch house. So anyone that's coming in from police, say they were refused from police but they haven't been to court yet, they'll come to us. So we do, you know, the reception procedures which entails, you know, having to assess the person, making sure their welfare is okay, making sure their family is okay. When I say family, I mean, you know, immediate children that they might be taken care of or anything like that that makes their stay, let's call it, a little easier. So that that's your initial reception or it could just be coming from the courthouse. The court might call you up and say, hey, I've got this guy, he's about to be sentenced or female, whatever, can you come over and receive them? So it's all about that initial receival process. They might be here, you know, for up to 72 hours before we actually send them on to another location or, you know, they might come into our custody with police today and their court date's not until tomorrow. So they'll stay overnight with us and then they'll go to court, say, tomorrow and they might say, yep, no, your bail refused on to jail for, you know, three months or whatever the case might be or we might do a bail release. So the judge might say, no, well, you can get out on these conditions. Then we go through that process of the release here as well. It is like a little mini prison, but you've just got your added few things like your transport. So we transport our males from here most of the time to Tenworth if we can confirm beds at Tenworth, but we have been to other areas as well, like it might be still to Wellington or something like that, wherever the beds are available into their remand centres and then they'll go through the process again and put into where they need to go there. The females, they actually get flown out of here from Moree, so they get police air wing to come in and they fly them to MRRC or Silver Water Women's is what it's also known as. So our female inmates, we don't normally transport via a vehicle. We um, pass them on to police or take them out to the airport and police take over. Is it mainly men that you're dealing with, male prisoners? Are there many female prisoners that come through? There's a few. There's not as many as men, but yes, you're right. The dominant sex is men that come through. But we also do returns for court. So if I've sent someone away today, they have a hearing date in 12 months' time where the judge says, you know, I want you back here in person. So then we'll transport back from the correctional centre back to our centre and we'll actually take them to those court appearances as well. So it's not just people that are just being sentenced and they've just we've sent them off but it's also people that have to come back and face the court. And you know what, they might get released at the time as well. It sounds like you're dealing with the point of contact that potentially could be the most volatile because it's when they're finding out really bad things or they've just been arrested so their emotions are high, they potentially weren't expecting to be arrested or charged or that kind of thing. Am I on the right track? Is it a very emotional kind of part to be involved in? Absolutely. It is probably at the highest point. They could be on the streets and be completely drug affected, for example, come in, be completely defiant with police, completely defiant with us, don't want to do a single thing. Sometimes they don't even want to go to court. Having said that, there is a lot of times where they just come in, they come to us and they go, all right, you know, I've just got to get this done, do what I need to do and then off I go. So you take the good with the bad, but we have people that come in that are actually mental health patients where They'll come to us first and then the judge might order an assessment. They might go off to a mental health institution. So people are all different when they come in here. They could be very highly aggressive, very highly, you know, like volatile. They could be suffering massive mental health issues. But on the other hand, they could have, it just could be something minor where they come in, the process is made quite simple, quite civil, let's say, and everything's completely fine. You just never know what's going to come through that door. And is it all kinds of crime in terms of like what you would call, I guess, more minor to, you know, murder, rape, all of the above? Yeah, absolutely. We get a bit of everything, obviously some more than others because simple crimes are probably what we get the most of, something such as, you know, contravene an ABO order or driving offences which have happened a little too often or you possess drugs or stealing, just little things. And when I say little, I mean don't get me wrong, I'm not condoning them, but they are more minor than others such as, you know, murders, rapes, pedophilia, those sorts of things. But we definitely do get them all through the door. Very interesting characters sometimes. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bath. 
I'm speaking with Corrective Services Officer Stevie Munro about her time working in court escort security. Up next, Stevie discusses the one moment that's really stayed with her while working in the Watch House. The story does detail an attempted suicide, so please take care while listening. Does anything surprise you any more about the people who walk through your doors? What are some of those experiences that have stayed with you over the years? You know what? Nothing surprises me. It's actually become quite, I wouldn't say entertaining, but, you know, if you get something different, you're like, oh, my God, that's different. Like, I haven't had that one. How does that happen? Because there's such a range here from very high to very low, you sort of go, I can't expect anything different now. Whatever comes through, there's coming through there regardless. Something that stuck with me, uh, look, I'm going to say I had my most toughest moment in my job only about oh, three weeks ago, four weeks ago maybe, I'm just taking into account leave here. I had a guy come through and he, he was on firearm offences. He was never an issue, you know, no issue with us. Now his family come in and his children who are around the same age as I was when mum and dad went to prison. And believe it or not, it was just the most simplest thing where I had to go out and communicate with the family. You know, they were asking lots of questions and then the girls, you know, become very upset and it was a bit of a trigger point for me, believe it or not, out of all the things that happen, you know, when you've got people coming into custody and then that can happen in custody, that was, believe it or not, my biggest moment on the job where I've gone, oh, my goodness, like this was me and it hit a sore point. However, in saying that, because of my past experience, I was able to sit down with the girls and say, you know, look, it's not the end of the world. Give them a little bit of an inside perspective to assure them that, you know, their dad's been looked after and he's okay, don't stress too much. I even just said, you know, how about you draw dad a picture and we'll, I'll take it into him for you and he can have that with him. You know, I'm sure he would appreciate it. And once they left, they obviously are upset, but they were okay. And it was good to be able to, to give them that side of things. But at the same time, for me, that was the toughest I've been through yet. A little bit more of an insight. The other thing I would say is the death in custody thing. So I haven't actually come across a death in custody, but it's come very close quite a few times. So when people are coming in here and they're upset and they're, you know, emotionally driven, a lot of time you'll have a lot of self-harm or people just don't want to be here anymore. They'll either be very volatile or they'll just want to do away with themselves right or wrong. I have had quite a few close encounters, one of which sticks out. It was a guy in the cells. We had quite a few things going on at the same time. We were walking past his cell to do other movements throughout the day and then right next door to him was another inmate that just was screaming and yelling and hitting things and, you know, so you were somewhat distracted at the same time that this was going on. But we didn't actually realise as we are going past when he'd see us, he'd sit up and when we'd walk past and he thought we were gone, he was actually wrapping stuff around his neck to the point where it looked like he was literally just having a rest, like he was just laying down, resting. And I have no idea what made me look twice, but I, I looked twice and I went, I think this guy's got that blanket around his neck. And they're like, no, 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 I run straight out there. And sure enough, it was. It was wrapped in such a way that you, you actually couldn't see it properly until you went out and actually grabbed the blanket from him and cut it off him to see how everything was was done and then when we went back on the footage it was about I'm gonna say maybe about 40 minutes this guy who was a very compliant person very well mannered please thank you is not a single issue and it was the quiet one that was secretly sitting there going you know what I don't want to do this anymore anyway having said that we got the blanket from him, we sought medical attention and in the end he was okay. But if it wasn't for that, I suppose, your stomach instinct, mm. he probably wouldn't be here today and I probably would have been going through coroner's court saying, please explain why you now have a death in custody. So that's how quick and easy it can happen. I want to ask if on the job you've ever felt in danger, if there's ever been a scenario where an inmate has gotten particularly kind of in your face Look, I mean, they get in your face as a way of intimidation quite a bit, but I can't really say that I've felt that unsafe because I've always got safe numbers in staffing. So always ensure that we've got safe 
operating numbers so that we are going home to our families, that we are staying safe. That to me is probably the main portion. Of course, your adrenaline is going to be high at different times when you're dealing with different people. That's just a given. But as far as feeling very unsafe and, you know, anything untowards, no. I actually have faith in my communication and my staff and hopefully they do in me too. <laughs> do you have a weapon just in case? Out on the streets and stuff, yes, we, we carry a firearm. We do have tools of restraints and stuff like that. So we, we have the use of handcuffs, we have the use of batons, aerosols and stuff if we need to defuse a situation. We have a whole bunch of tactical options that are available to us if need. But that's communication is definitely, definitely going to be your best tool in this job. You've described some fairly intense experiences that come from doing the kind of work that you do. I'd love to know how you deal with that when you go home. Is there anything specific you do to, you know, decompress? My partner's actually a retired police sergeant, so he's seen enough that it's easy for me to go home and go, oh, my goodness, and, you know, you just let it all out because that's what they're used to, and and he's very good. He will take it all on board. He'll let me have my vent, and then we'll just move on. But also I think growing up in this town and having seen a lot before this job, it sort of just comes naturally really. I do look at it a lot of the time when I have really crappy days as, you know what, Stevie, that's your job, that's what you do. And you just process it in your own mind. You might be a bit deflated, a bit fatigued. You just go have a rest and then we start again. Is your job what you expected? Is anything surprised you about it? Definitely not what I expected in a lot of ways. In some it is, but in others it's like, wow, I can actually do that. Do you know what I mean? So It opens up so many doors once you're in and you can go, all right, I could do this career path, that career path, all within the same department. But it's definitely not what I expected it to be as far as that goes and career progression. It is sort of what I expected it to be in a prison setting, but out here in Maury, it's different again. You don't have that big wing of people who you get to see day in, day out. It's somebody different every single time and you're like, oh, my goodness. But you you will see a familiar face every now and then. That happens. It is what it is. But just the, the variety of it is more so what I didn't expect. I know that you've said that you come across kind of inmates that you potentially know. What about on the other side when they get out? Do you see, you know, someone that you might have dealt with in the system in Coles? All the time, all the time. You know, when someone comes past and they say, hey, miss, you're like, hello, how is it here? <laughs> you know exactly where you know them from. Touch wood, I haven't had a bad experience yet. I think I'm pretty level-headed and can assess the situation enough to understand what my limits are, and I think that's helped. I don't believe that I've come across a person who has been negative towards me, if anything, one might have just walked past and just completely pretended like they didn't see me. But as far as, you know, people that have come out of custody, they'll always say hello. They're always very polite or they'll acknowledge in some way, shape or form. What has working in corrections taught you about people? Oh, things I didn't already know. I don't <laughs> it, it's a tricky one, actually, because I've always been a very inquisitive person. So I've probably had that instinct for a little while, maybe due to my childhood, I'm not sure, but Maybe more so that not everyone's a bad person. Not everybody that comes through here is a bad person. You know, you like to think prison, you know, they've obviously done something wrong and it's terrible. They're an inmate. That's what a lot of people think. However, that's not the case. The everyday people that come in, they might have made a mistake. Some people might have actually intentionally done it. Of course, I'll grant that. However, there is people here that probably shouldn't be here. Thanks to Stevie for sharing her story with us. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted and produced by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Scott Stronick. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another True Crime Conversation.